Good morning, good morning. Let's stand. I want to welcome you this morning. Um, there's a lot of things going on in our personal lives and in our country, but we serve a great God that nothing bothers him, nothing takes him for, um, by surprise, and we can trust him. So let's go ahead and say our scripture, Psalms 95. <coughs> Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. In his hands are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand today, if you will hear his voice. Father, we just come to you today and we thank you, Lord, that you are a great, faithful, and a God that never leaves us alone. You always draw us closer to you, and we thank you for that, God. There's nothing in this earth that can come against us that we do not have victory over because we are one of yours. And so, God, we just give this time to you. We focus our hearts towards you. We focus our attention to you, God. And, Lord, we just want to sing to you this morning and adore you and glorify your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus. 
Father God, we love you this morning. You truly do deserve all the glory, Father, all the honor and the praise. So, Lord, we just ask that everything we do and say this morning would bring glory to your name and that, Lord, you would be pleased with our attitudes, our actions, and our words. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You may be seated. Nope, we're good. Amen. All right, let's uh, just start dismissing kids if we could. We'll start with Miss Etika's group. So or if you are with Miss Etika, sign of a healthy church, half of our sanctuary is getting ready to disappear. So it's all good. All right, and now nursery age. That would be Gideon and Jeremiah. And Melody's going to. All right. Very good, very good, very good. Miss Heather's group. And who's going down today, Jimmy? Brandon? All right. So now we'll go Brandon's group. Amen. All right, you should have gotten a bulletin this morning. Just a couple of things just to point out to you. The women's ministry will kick back off again on January the 18th. Um, and it will be uh, live and via Zoom. So if you can't make it here, um, make sure that uh, you get signed on uh, to the Zoom. See, uh, you can see Lauren uh, or Etika to make sure you get that invitation and all the stuff that's going to go on with that. And it's 7 o'clock. Yeah, 7 o'clock on Mondays. Uh, and then, of course, our Wednesday Bible studies uh, are also on Zoom and live here. So those are 7 o'clock as well. And um, so we had a good men's breakfast yesterday, some really good conversation and, and uh, spending some time in the Word. We're going through a book called Change Agents and dealing with how we are going to continue to impact our world. Amen to get involved where we need to get involved. And uh, so uh, those are just some areas that you can get caught up with and all of that. So um, you guys can read that. So thank you very much for your faithfulness and your giving and all that you do there. Um, those of you that are online, uh, this morning we're going to do something a little bit differently for the online folks. You're going to see Amy. All right. Amy's going to say hi to you. Um, we have Jimmy we're greeting at the door here physically, we're going to have Amy start being our greeter online uh, to reach out to folks that are coming online. So if you have a prayer request this morning, uh, a question or a comment that you need an answer to, um, Amy's going to be monitoring all that for us and feeding that back to us so we have all that information. So uh, please uh, reach out to us um, because even though we can't all be in person, uh, we all want to be connected. And we want to make sure that the needs are being met. So if you have a prayer request, please put it in the comments there so that uh, Amy can see it and uh, get that fed to us. So thank you, Amy, for stepping up and taking care of that for us. I appreciate you. All right. So we're beginning week two of our 21-day fast. Um, and uh, so the other piece of paper that you got was our prayer emphasis for this week. All right, the prayer emphasis for this week, we're leaving the first two the same. Remember, our complete focus for this fast is, God, what do I need to learn? God, what do I need to learn? Because you're either learning, growing, or you're dying. And we want to be growing. We want to be learning. So, God, what is it that I need to learn going into this new year? All right, and the second one is, what do I need to leave? You know, there are things in our lives that we're doing that are zapping our strength that they may not be good or bad, but we don't need to be doing them anymore. We need to change some of our behaviors because we operate in insanity. We keep doing the exact same thing over and over again, and we expect something to change. But so even if it's not a bad thing, it just may be a thing that you've done for years and years. It's become a tradition, and it's no longer worth your time. So God, what do I need to leave and then the next prayer focus uh, for this week is going to be, God, give me eyes and ears to hear your word that you have for my life. 
We, we began to pray for direction last week uh, for each of our lives. And this week, we're really going to focus on, God, give me eyes and ears. Because we learned we spent, what, four weeks on hearing the voice of God. And through this process, through this fast, you should be listening and hearing the voice of God. I was talking to Pastor Leo this morning. I said, if you're not, back up and try again. Because God is speaking. Amen? You're allowed to talk to me. It's good. I know you're all covered up, but you can still. All right? The thing is, God is speaking. We need to be tapping into what God is saying. And the next thing we need to pray for is the leadership. Leadership of this church, uh, that God gives us wisdom as we navigate and as we move through. Uh, but also leadership in our local, our state, and our national government. We need to pray for the people that are leading us, that are going through and doing the elected officials that we have uh, locally, that God give them wisdom. Because, you know, this pandemic has been crazy for everybody. There's a lot of decisions that have to be made, and the, the rule book's been thrown out. We're having to play by a whole different set of rules. So they need wisdom. They need a revelation. They need understanding. So pray for them as they go through, whether that's the Board of Education, uh, whether it's our law enforcement, whether it's our mayors, uh, our, our councilmen, whatever that case may be, uh, let's lift them up in prayer. Our state representatives, uh, the last place I would want to sit right now is in the governor's office. Man, the decisions that guy has to make and the things that he's having to do, um, I don't envy him that job whatsoever. So I pray for his health. I pray for wisdom uh, that he's able to guide and direct this state as we move forward. And then on our national level, uh, we have uh, an inauguration coming up uh, in a week or so. Uh, we need to pray for um, uh, President-elect Biden. You know, you, you, you make your voice heard at the ballot box, and I've preached this for years. You make your voice heard at the ballot box. When the election's over, your responsibility shifts. Your responsibility now is to pray for protection, for wisdom, and for guidance. That's your responsibility. That's my responsibility. So election's over. Okay, We're having a, we're having a, a, a new president. Whether you like it, whether you don't. I'm not here to argue that point. I'm here to tell you that as a Christian, your responsibility is to pray. It's to lift our elected officials up before God. So this week, this is going to be our prayer focus. Uh, if you've not been able to participate in the fast yet, uh, it's not too late to jump on board. If you don't make 21 days, nobody's going to beat you. Uh, nobody's chasing you down and trying to, to figure out. But uh, one of the things when you need a miracle, and it's something we're going to talk about this morning, is we are spirit, soul, and body, right? That's what the scripture says. But so many times we live body, soul, and spirit. We're more worried about our body and our flesh and our stuff that we live that way. So we, when we set our priorities, we set our priorities body, soul, and spirit. When God says your spirit, soul, and and body. So what fasting does is it helps us correct our view. It helps us to, to take and bring the body under subjection to the spirit. So fasting, if you look at it through the scriptures, it's all through the scriptures. I mean, there's not a place in the New Testament or the Old Testament that fasting is not listed. And fasting needs to become a part of our regular life. Uh, we're going to begin to ask as we end this fast, we're going to ask that Wednesdays for the entire year become a day of fasting from the hour of 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. We're going to ask that we set that time aside for prayer and fasting. Listen, remember, what do we say about fasting? Fasting without prayer is what? A diet. I'm not asking you to go on a diet. I'm asking you to spend time with God to gain his insight on your life. Because how much better would it be if I'm walking according to the will of God? Does the word say that the steps of the righteous are ordered of God? It does. Then, if my steps have already been ordered, why do I run into brick walls? 
Why do I continually uh, hit roadblocks? Why do I continually have to change directions? Could it be that I'm missing the steps that have been ordered? Is it possible that I'm walking in my steps instead of the steps that God has ordered for me? Is it, it, you know, let me, let me simplify it. I do that. I get in myself. I start this journey. I start the walk and I start in the right way. I know I have a word from God, but somewhere in the mix, I get into me and I start making decisions. It's really bad when Doug takes over because I have the ability to mess things up. But when I allow God to guide and direct me, he's given me the talents and he's given me what the word says, the wealth to be able to accomplish everything he wants me to accomplish. I may not be able to accomplish it in myself, but if I walk according to the steps that God set for me, then I can accomplish it. The next few weeks, we're going to spend some time in the book of Nehemiah, my favorite book in the Old Testament. And we're going to look at Nehemiah because here's a guy who had a burden. And I would venture to say if I was to do a survey in here this morning and talk, every one of us has a burden. May not be the same, but every one of us has a burden. What do you do with that burden? How do you handle that burden? How do you, because God says, bring it to me, and my burden, God's burden is easy and light. But sometimes the one I'm carrying is huge. I can't make it through this process. So Nehemiah teaches us something. Let's go over to Nehemiah chapter 1. And we'll start here. It says, and it come to pass in the months... of Chislev in the 20th year as it was that one of my brethren came with the men from Judah and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped who had served who had survived the captivity and concerning Jerusalem and they said to me the survivors who have left from captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The walls of Jerusalem uh, is also broken down and the gates burn with fire. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and I wept and I mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before God, before the God of heaven. Here's the process. He finds out that he's hometown is being destroyed. Now we can see this. No matter where you stand politically, what happened this past week was a travesty. It was bad. If you don't have a burden for anything else, you should have a burden for our country. And here's Nehemiah that finds out that his country is in complete devastation. Complete devastation. And when he heard it, the first thing he did was begin to pray and to fast. So the word of God says, if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then you'll hear from heaven and I'll heal their land. So this prayer and fasting, this time that Nehemiah began to go into, he says, now when you're hit with a big burden, what should you do? When you're hit with a major burden, and listen, this burden could also be translated as mountain. A mountain is something that cannot be uh, overcome by yourself. If you could overcome it, it wouldn't be a mountain. The mountain in your life could be anything. It could be a food addiction. It could be a nicotine addiction. It could be a drug addiction. It could be addiction to television. It could be addiction to Facebook. It can be addiction to all kinds of things. But a mountain, by definition, is something I cannot overcome by myself. So here's a situation that Nehemiah's facing. There's no way he can fix it by himself. So he begins the process saying, God, here's my burden. What am I going to do? I'm going to begin to pray and fast. So he said, I said, and I prayed, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, 
you who keep your covenants and mercies. See what he's doing here? The very first thing he does when he comes into the presence of God, he did not bring his need first. He did not bring his burden first. So many times, Rob, when we begin to pray, we come into God's presence and we say, oh, God, help me. That's where we start. But the model prayer teaches us to do what? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Nehemiah sets it here long before the model prayer was ever put out. The very first thing is he, he put God in his proper place. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in putting God in his proper place, it puts himself in a proper place. He viewed it correctly. In other words, he's saying, God, you're great and I'm not. How many of us have situations in our life that God needs to be great and not us? We've tried the great and it's not worked out so well. So in this time, we need to begin to put God in his proper place. God, you're great. You're the God above all. The name above all names. In your name, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. You are top dog. And when we put him in his proper place, now all of a sudden, we've released him to move in our life. Because understand again this. How does God move on earth? Through us. Because who has dominion on earth? We do. So there's a little bit of a misleading comment that we make in church all the time. And that comment that we make in church all the time, Kim, is that God is in control. That's a misleading statement. God would like to be in control. God will be glad to be in control if we let him. Whatever is bound on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever is loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. We sit around here doing nothing thinking it's going to be the other way around, and God's waiting for us to ask. God is waiting for us to release. God is waiting for us to allow him to do what he needs to do. Yes, God can be in control. And in some of our lives, God is in control. So the statement's not a lie. I'm not beginning to say that at all. But there's many people that make the statement that it's not a truth for them. Because he's not in control because we don't let him be in control. We've not released. God, you're in control. And God says, go here. We go there. We pull a Jonah. God said, go to Nineveh. He goes to Tarshish. Complete opposite direction. Was God in control? Nope. But at some point in time, did God become in control? Yep. It took him how long in the belly of a great fish? Three days. I'm sorry. I don't know that it would have taken me that long. I might have been repenting before I hit the water. I'm not sure. But at some point, God became in control. So that's where we are in our lives at this point is we've got to put God in his proper place so that he can be in control. So that we are making decisions according to his word. So this is what Nehemiah does. And he goes in then and he says, forgive me of my sins. And not only my sins, but the sins of my fathers. We have messed up. We have got to be willing uh, an old pastor friend of mine used to say this all the time, forget you're a Christian for a minute and tell the truth. We've got to be willing to say, God, I messed up. God, I've sinned before you. And listen, sin is not always immoral. Sin, by definition, is missing the mark. Missing the mark of the high calling of God. God, I didn't hit what you asked me to do. I sinned against you. I didn't fulfill all the things that you asked me to do, I missed it. So God, I'm sorry, forgive me. There are places and times in the ministry where I see things and I go and, I, and, and at the end of it, I have to turn around and say, God, man, I missed that. Forgive me. This is where Nehemiah was. Nehemiah was at the place where he said, God, forgive me. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing, you guys can go back and read this, okay? So then Nehemiah begins to pray and he brings the petition. He says, you see the condition of my world. 
My hometown, Jerusalem, your holy city is laying in ruins. The temple is destroyed. The gates are on fire. And it's a mess. Now, we relate that to us today. Who's the temple now? We are. We're the temple. So there's points in time and areas of my life where I have to say, God, my temple is a mess. My walls are not built and the gates are on fire. I need you. So he began to pray. And he says, God, I'm going to go before the king. So this day, today, give me favor. And that's how chapter one kind of wraps up. Because see, he could go before the king because it says in the last verse there, it says, for I was the cupbearer, the king's cupbearer. Now, so many people, when they think of the cupbearer, they think that that was just the guy that tasted the wine so the king didn't get killed by poison. Well, if you go back and look at the responsibilities in the king's court, that was actually the administrative executive assistant. He was it. He was, uh, one pastor said, he was the associate pastor. He was the executive secretary. He made sure everything that needed to happen in the court happened. He protected the king. He scheduled his appointments. He made sure nobody came in and out that wasn't supposed to. Nehemiah had a big job. He had favor with the king. And it's kind of deceptive because we jump into verse 2 right off the bat, or chapter 2, and it says, it came to pass in the month of Nisan. Now, remember, he started in uh, Cheslin, or Chislin, and now he's in Nisan. No, I had to go back and look. I said, okay, there, there's, a, there's a span of time that happened here. So Cheslin was the ninth month of the year, somewhere between November, December. And Nisan was the first month of their calendar, which is March to April. We're dealing with four months. So if we can read this and look at this, for those four months, Nehemiah prayed, Today, God, give me favor with the king. And the next day he gets up and he says, Today, God, give me favor with the king. Today, God... Give me for four months. Now, here's the issue we run into. We live in a society that wants to drive through, place the order, and get it and leave. We don't want to put in the work necessary. We don't want to grab a hold of the horns of the altar and pray through. We want to pray too. There's a difference. But we need to hold on and pray through. Listen, we're on a 21 day fast, but what happens if you don't have your answer at the end of the 21 days? Keep going. I don't know who said it, but thank you. Thank you, George. You're on it, baby. You got it. You get a sticker for the day. Keep going. How long do you go? Till you get the answer. We, we want to stop. Well, pastor said we're doing 21 days. I should have my answer by the end of 21 days. Well, there's a lot of things that go into that. When did you start listening? Are you praying correctly? Is it possible to pray incorrectly? Absolutely. It says you can pray amiss. It's one of the reasons the Word of God says you don't get an answer. That's why we begin the prayers with God, give me direction. Help me to see. Now we're looking at the focus. Give me eyes to see and ears to hear what you have for my life so that I can pray your Word. Because Nehemiah began to remind God of what he promised. This is what we need to do. Your prayer life will completely change when you begin to remind God of what he says. You realize he likes it when you remind him of what he says? God, you told me right here that this is what you would do. And people are like, oh, no, you can't talk. Yeah, God likes it. You know, one of the reasons he likes it, because then he says, oh, they listened. They heard what I had to say. 
And he looks at that as a sign of respect, not disrespect. Bring the word of God before God. This is what Nehemiah began to do. So four months he prayed, God, give me favor. Four months, every day, God, give me favor. God, give me favor. God, give me favor. So then it comes up that it says that um, that there was before the king the wine, and he gave it to the king. Now I had never been sad in his presence before. Verse 2. Therefore, the king said to me, why is your face sad since you are not sick? Do you realize that it was against the law to frown in the presence of the king? He wasn't allowed to be sad unless he was so sick he couldn't stand up. So it was against the law. So the king looks at him and says, whoa, 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 something's not right here. Why is your face sad? Sad, since you're not sick. This is nothing but sorrow of heart. Now, here's a, here is a non-Christian pagan king that's seeing something that God wants him to see. Because look what get, what's getting ready to happen. So I became dreadfully afraid. This is Nehemiah. And I said to the king, May the king live forever. First thing he did was, oh, sorry, I apologize. You're great, and I know you could take my life, but I'm going to be honest with you. May the great king live forever. See, where, where did I leave off here? I lost my spot. Okay, verse 3. Uh, why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tomb, lies in waste and the gates burn with fire? Then the king said to me, what do you request? Now, all of a sudden, I've been praying, favor, favor, favor. And the most unlikely place says, what do you need? What do you request? So what did Nehemiah do? He prayed, oh, God, give me wisdom. Let me ask for the right stuff. Because he could have said, king, would you send somebody to rebuild Jerusalem? Would you uh, consider, no, what, what did he do? He said, if it please the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to, Judy, to Judy, Judah, to the city of my father's tomb, that I may rebuild it. So he says, I need time off. Goes to the king, and he says, I need time off. So the king responds back to him and says, uh, how long? Do you need to be gone? When will you return? So he comes with an answer. He didn't go unprepared. The worst thing you can do when you, God is, is leading you to, is not have an answer. I always tell people, uh, don't bring me a problem unless you have a solution. Bring me a problem with a suggestion. So here's Nehemiah. He says, here's the problem, and here's the suggestion. I need to go. King says, how long do you need to go? Well, if you read the entire book of Nehemiah, you're going to find out it was 12 years. He asked for 12 years off. I don't know how many bosses of yours would give you 12 years off, but this is what he's asking his boss for. He said, I need 12 years. So the king looks at him and says, uh, well, what else can I do? He said, furthermore, uh, if it please the king, I need a letter given to me by the governor that will give me safe travels. And then I need, also need a letter that's going to go to the, the keeper of the forest because I need your wood. So here's what he paid for, prayed for. He prayed for paid time off. He prayed for government protection. And he prayed for the government to pay for it. And guess what the king did? go. Now, there's a few things you need to know of what was going on here. The king was not an idiot. There was a lot of uprisings going on in that region, and he knew he needed a place to set up his um, army in that region. It was time that that was going on. So it benefited the king to have Jerusalem rebuilt because that would give him a base of operations. 
So if Nehemiah had tried to do this three months ago, it wouldn't have been time yet. Because the battle had not yet raged over Syria enough for the king to give it any attention whatsoever. Sometimes we don't know everything that's going on in the heavenlies, but we don't stop praying. We don't stop going after. Because now the, the season was right. The king was ripe for the picking. He looked and he said, you know what? I need a base of operations there to deal with the uprising that's going on. What am I going to do? Now Nehemiah steps in and says, hey, let me rebuild Jerusalem. Not only let me be, rebuild Jerusalem, but how about paying for it? And how about paying me while I go do it? And provide me protection to make sure I get there. When you're walking in the will of God, nothing is impossible. He should have been killed for having a frown on his face. And then he turns around and asks for 12 years off. Man, when I started digging through this uh, story and looking at it from this day, my mind was just completely blown. Of everything that Nehemiah had the intestinal fortitude to ask for. When God puts it in you, he will also put everything in you that you need to accomplish it. Nehemiah did not have in himself the, the wherewithal to rebuild Jerusalem. He didn't have the money. Wasn't there. God, how am I going to start the business? I can't afford it. How can we start a ministry? How can we buy a facility? How can we can't afford it? When we started Oasis Worship Center, I sat down with two guys. I sat down with Pineapple, Tom Paul. Some of you guys still remember him. And I sat down with Tony um, Bernardo. And we were sitting in Subway. I, I sprung. I bought him Subway. We sat down in Subway and I said, we're going to start a church. And Pineapple was like, it's about time, let's go. And then there was Tony. How are you going to pay for it? So you know you need both. You really do. You've got to have both in your life. And, and I said, Pineapple, you're right. It is time. And Tony, I have no idea. I have no clue. So we said, he said, where are we going to start it at? I said, I don't know. So I go home that night, and Etika said, well, we got the basement of the bakery. Doesn't look much like a church. But sure, why not? So we decided to have our first service. We went to Walmart and bought 10 metal chairs. We didn't have the basement ready yet, so we set them up in the top office area of the bakery, and we had church. Didn't make any sense whatsoever. And on top of it, just to mess everybody up, Frank, we started it in January. You never start a church in bad weather. You don't do it. It's, it's the wrong time. But we were acting on a word from God that said do it. When we started the business, when Etika started the business, we didn't have the money to even think about it. But that business was built with never taking a loan. And it didn't do too bad. In 15 years, it did okay. Because when God gives you direction, he will give you everything you need to fulfill that direction. So don't make the excuse, God, I don't have the wherewithal to do that. If God said it, it's time for him to do it. The, the way we wrap it up is God's will is God's bill. So it was God's will for Jerusalem to be rebuilt so that his people could be brought back together again. He wasn't worried about the king having a base of operation, but he utilized it. I've got a friend of mine that's been trying to add on to their church facility for years, and the government kept Re rejecting their permit to build. Nope, nope. They continue to pray and continue to pray and continue to pray and continue to pray and got a report from him yesterday that they just approved his permit to build. 
I said, what changed? He said, people in office. I had to wait until God had the right people in place to sign the right papers to let me do what I needed to do. And he said, the, 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 the temptation I had to overcome was to become bitter and angry at the people that didn't sign. But you know what? We really weren't financially ready to build yet. So their no's was God's grace, and the whole time that they said no, the coffers to build continued to grow. Now, all of a sudden, God's will says, okay, now build. Now I need you to do this. So the money's already there. The people have signed all the paperwork. All the permits are in place. Construction begins. It's done. But if we stop praying, we stop asking. So let's drive this home to us. Let's say that your burden or your mountain that you're facing um, is, is uh, nicotine, smoking. And you have tried and tried. And believe I've, I've said this for years and years. Smoking is not going to send you to hell. It's just going to make you smell like you've been there. Okay? So I'm not even going there. So the thing is, you're, you're trying, you're trying, you're trying to quit. And no matter what you do, you cannot quit. It's one of the most difficult habits to break. It just is. You can't do it. You can't do it. You can't do it. For you, it is a mountain. But God asked you, he said, I need you to quit. Because with what you're doing and the financial blessing I need to do to you, you can't afford to buy a carton of cigarettes once a week. You need that money to put in to get you out of debt, to get you out of da 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 But you say, God, I can't quit in myself. It's my mountain. So he said, all I need is the faith of a mustard seed. A mustard seed is the smallest seed in the garden. But it produces the largest plant. The mustard seed, when it planted and it dies and it breaks out, produces a plant that is up to 15 feet tall. The one little seed. And God says, if you have that type of faith, planted in the correct ground, watered by the word of God, when it expands and blows, it's going to produce something that's greater than anything you could have ever thought of. So I just need your mustard seed. So we say, okay, God, I'm going to start. And it says, if you'll give me that faith, then you can say to that mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea. And it has to obey you. So now, instead of just saying a New Year's resolution, that's why they don't work. Because New Year's resolutions are based on you. But now I'm going in and said, God has said, quit. I will quit. The next morning you get up and you light up, you have your coffee, and all of a sudden you go, oh, I was supposed to quit. God, forgive me. Give me the strength. I'm going to quit. You light up. God, forgive me. It, this prayer went on for four and a half months. I know people that have been praying that prayer for a year, two years, three years. It'll come. When do you quit? When do you stop praying? You don't until the mountains are removed. I used to chew tobacco years ago when I was in the Navy and before. And my last cruise before I was getting ready to get out was a North Atlantic cruise. And Etika asked me to quit chewing while I was on that cruise. That was like asking me to cut off my right arm. You know, it was just, you don't understand. She said, do me a favor and quit. I said, all right, I'll quit. So at the start of the cruise, I quit. And I, I told you last week, I replaced the pouch that I carried in my hip pocket with a Bible. And every time that I would reach for a chew, I'd pull out and I'd read a scripture. I was doing great. We were two and a half months into a three-month cruise, getting ready to come home. And a part in the engine room broke down. And as the machinist on board, I had to make a new part. So I had to stay up and work until that part was done. And I was stressed out of my mind. I was like, I got to have a chew. So I went to the ship's store and I bought a pouch of Red Man and I put a chew in. Any of you have been in the hospital or anything and haven't had nicotine for a while, you know it makes you a little bit green when you first start back. 
Makes you a little lightheaded. Well, I take this too, and all of a sudden, we hit Hurricane Gertrude. Day one of chewing again, coupled with 30-foot seas, makes for a disaster. I threw up my toenails. Every part of me, every everything, and I mean, we were a mess. We had to stay in Portsmouth, England for an extra month to be welded back together so we could come home. That's how bad this storm beat us to death. And while I'm sitting there praying, I'm saying, God, this is just wrong. Now I can't even stand the smell of it. Can't handle even the smell of it. And I look at that as my Jonah experience that said to win this, to beat this, it took more than me just saying I'm going to quit. It took a little storm called Gertrude. And God did that for me. Because health-wise, I needed to quit. Now, I'm not praying for a Gertrude in your life. I'm really, I'm really not. But I'm just saying, God, if you, if you are truly interceding and you are truly going after God and you are truly walking in his path, he will do whatever it takes, even giving you a hurricane, to get you where you need to be. If you don't stop. Remember when the angel of the Lord appeared unto Daniel? He scared Daniel. Because Daniel had been praying and praying and praying for 21 days for an answer. And the angel shows up and taps him on the shoulder, scares him. Sometimes you've been praying so long, when the answer comes, it'll catch you off guard. But here was the answer. And the angel said to him, listen, we ran into some resistance in the heavenlies. If you would have stopped praying, we'd have never got to you. It's possible that you're one prayer away from that breakthrough that you need, so don't stop. And when you're tired and you can't pray anymore, you call your covenant brothers and sisters in Christ and say, you got to pray with me because I can't do it anymore. My arms are tired. We remember the story of Moses. The battle was continuing to be won as long as his hands were raised. He had the staff, his hands are raised. He got tired as the day went on. Aaron and Hur steps along beside of him, lifts his arms and holds his arms for him, and a great victory is won. Sometimes you need others around you to hold your arms up so you can finish that battle. And we're going to talk about that as we go through Nehemiah. Because, see, you're going to have to build and you're going to have to battle at the same time. In this year that we're going into, I believe that it's going to be one of the best years the church has ever seen. I believe it with all that's in me. The churches that are preaching the word of God and are standing on the word of God, this will be a marquee year for us. Because there are souls that are crying out for rescue. And we're in a boat. And we're rowing by all those voices. And for so many years, the church has just rode right past them and never reached out to pick them up. But now we're in a place where we're going to be able to reach down and pick up those people and bring them into the boat, into the kingdom of God. Because there's nothing that makes people reach out to God more than disaster. When all these major disasters happen, what's the first thing? When 9-11 happened, Boy, it was the first thing everybody did. They went to church. No matter what their faith was, they went to church. I don't believe this is um, a bad time coming for the church. I believe this is the time for signs and wonders and miracles. I believe it with all that's in me. Because God promises us, Jesus in his own words says, greater works than these shall you do because I go to my Father which is in heaven. But for signs and wonders and miracles to take place, we have to be living spirit, soul, and body, not body, soul, and spirit. So we've got to take it to where the world is being removed from the church, but the church is going into the world. I understand what I'm saying. 
The church has become so focused on making people comfortable. The church has become so focused on uh, programs. We think to have a worship service that we have to have smoke and lights and all this other stuff, and we have, a, have to have a high entertainment value. Listen, I, I'm an old garage band guy. I don't mind the smoke and lights. It's not that at all. But there comes a time where the hunger for the word of God has got to be enough. That you will travel for miles and miles and miles just to be in the presence of God, just to hear the word of God. That our kids are raised in the presence of God, that it's not a foreign concept. I was talking to a young man not very long ago, and he says, I'm tired of hearing about miracles. God's never shown me any, so he must not be real. That's got to change. But that's only going to change when we pull a Nehemiah and we pray and we fast and we stand and we continue to pray and we continue to ask and we have a plan. So that when the king looks at us and says, what do you want from me? Nehemiah had an answer, right? One more guy, Solomon. Solomon goes before the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He's praying. He said, God, I have no idea how to lead these people. I'm, getting, I'm, I'm king and I've got no clue. The king of kings and the Lord of lords asks him a question. You remember the question? What can I do for you? Same question Nehemiah was asked. Solomon says, give me wisdom to lead your people. What do they say about Solomon today? Wisest man to ever live. Why? He had a plan. When God said, now here's the thing. When God and you're praying and God looks at you and he said, Fran, what can I do for you? That's not the time to be religious and cute. That's the time to have a plan. That's the time to say, God, I need. This is what you can do for me. There was a time in my life when my finances were uh, not really good. And I always carried around in my wallet how much debt I had. Down to the cent. Just in case somebody walks up and said, what do you need? I did. Because I don't want to ask for a thousand if I need 10,000. And I would literally, I carried that with me so that when anybody says, what's your greatest need? I could look at my bills and say, well, this one's the most far behind and it's the most. That's my greatest need at this point in time. And I was prepared But I can be honest with you, coming into this year, I wasn't prepared. I wasn't prepared that if God showed up and said, Doug, what do you need? What can I do for you? I would have went, hmm, I don't know. And he would have said, good, I'll go to somebody else. And he would go over and said, Dan Don, what do you need? Uh, don't know. Okay, I'll, I'll go to somebody else. Because it says you don't have because you don't ask. So this is why as we're beginning this layer of, of teaching and we're beginning this layer of prayer, the first thing we're saying is, God, I need direction. I need to know what are those steps I need to hear your voice. I need to see what you're saying to me so that when, when the time comes and they come to me and they say, what do you have need of? I can say, I need this, 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 and by the way, pay for it. I want to be prepared at that level. So my question to you this morning is this, what do you need? What do you need? Now, I'm not at your wants yet. Let's hit your needs. Because he said, I'll meet all your needs according to his riches and glory, right? 
But he also says he'll give you the desires of your heart. We need to separate the two for a minute. And let's start in. What this year do you need? Every one of us are in a different place. Whether it's in education, whether it's in our jobs, we all face different obstacles and different challenges. What would happen if every day when you were getting ready to walk into your job, your place of business, you stopped and you said, God, today this is what I have need of. How many of us just show up every day and say, hmm, wonder what's going to happen today? We need to begin to live on purpose. Life does not just happen. We make it happen. That's why all my emails that I send from work, it's closed with make it a great day, not have a great day. Because if I leave it to have a great day, I'm not going to have very many. But I can make every day great. We need to begin to spiritually live on purpose. We come to church with no expectations. So we leave with no change. What would happen before you step in those doors if you would place a demand on the presence of God? This is what I expect today, God. And if it doesn't happen today, don't get mad. Come back. Stand at the door and say, God, today this is what I expect. How long? Well, for Nehemiah, it was four months. For Caleb, it was 45 years. I'm praying it's not 45 years. <laughs> I like it a little quicker than that. But I'm going to continue to pray through. Recovering the art of praying through. I like that. I may have to preach on that sometime. Recovering the art of praying through. So that we gain the results that God wants. We are the children of God with all the rights and responsibilities thereof. We need to act like it. You have access to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords into his courtroom where decisions are made. And how many times do we squander that? Do we not go in and say, God, what is it? How is it? What do I do? How do I accomplish it? Where do I get to? And then when we stand up and we present something to city council because we need something to change in the city, we have a complaint and not a solution. We come into the church and we complain about everything that's happening. We, we never bring a solution. We complain about our job, but we never bring a solution. We need to be people of solutions. So as you pray this week and you're praying for eyes and ears, the purpose for that prayer is so that when God comes to you, and he will, and he says to you, what do you need? you're going to have an intelligent answer. Because he will supply your needs. He'll supply your needs. So let's begin to pray intelligently. Let's don't waste our time in the presence of God with fluff. Let's not continue to pray the way we've always prayed. There are certain people in my life that I don't even have to be in the same room with them. If I hear how they start a prayer, I know who they are. And if you listen to me, my, 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 my statement that I always open every prayer with is Father God. I've gone back and watched sermon after sermon after sermon to see. And I started every time. So I begin to, in my prayer time, saying, God, why do I do that? So he began to reveal some things to me. And that was one of the things I said, do I need to learn or do I need to leave? He said, son, you need to learn. Because see, Father God to me was, I didn't have a dad. And I needed one. So every time I address him, he's father to me. 
So he said, that's okay to keep. I said, good. I don't have to leave that. So begin those processes so that as we go through, we're able to live life intelligently. Spirit, soul, and body. Amen? Father God, I love you. I thank you so much for your word today. Lord, I ask that this word would become part of us. That, Lord, we would not be hearers only, but we would be doers of the word. So, Lord, I submit it all to you today. And I ask that you would be pleased with all that was said. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.